Good morning, this is uh, Father Tom Reeves, and welcome today to Morning Prayer this Wednesday, August the 19th, 2020. Let us worship our God together. Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now, Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Our Psalter reading comes from Psalm 119, verses 145 through 176. I will call with my whole heart. Answer me, O Lord, that I may keep your statutes. I call you, O oh, that you would save me. I will keep your decrees. Early in the morning I cry out to you, for in your word is my trust. My eyes are open in the night watches, that I may meditate upon your promise. Hear my voice, O Lord, according to your loving kindness, according to your judgments. Give me life. They draw near who in malice persecute me. They are very far from your law. You, O Lord, are near at hand, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your decrees that you have established them forever. Behold my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. According to your promise, give me life. Deliverance is far from the wicked, for they do not study your statutes. Great is your compassion, O Lord. Preserve my life according to your judgments. There are many who persecute and oppress me, yet have not, I have not swerved from your decrees. I look with loathing at the faithfulness, or excuse me, I look at loathing at the faithless, for they have not kept your word. See how I love your commandments. O Lord, in your mercy, preserve me. The heart of your word is truth. All your righteous judgments endure forevermore. Rulers have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I am as glad because of your promise as one who finds great spoils. As for lies, I hate and abhor them, but your law is my love. Seven times a day do I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have they who love your law. For them there is no stumbling block. I have hoped for your salvation, O Lord, and have fulfilled your commandments. I have kept your decrees, and I have loved them deeply. I have kept your commandments and decrees, for all my ways are before you. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you 
deliver me according to your promise. My lips shall pour forth your praise when you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall sing of your promise, for all your commandments are righteous. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your commandments. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let me live and I will praise you, and your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a sheep that is lost. Search for your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Judges chapter 18. While the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate, the five men who had gone to spy out the land proceeded to enter and take the idol of cast metal, the ephod, and the teraphim. The priest was standing by the entrance of the gate with 600 men armed with weapons of war. When the men went into Micah's house and took the idol of cast metal, the ephod, and the teraphim, the priest said to them, what are you doing? They said to him, keep quiet. Put your hand over your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. It is better for you to be a priest in the house of one person or to be a priest to a tribe and clan in Israel. Then the priest accepted the offer. He took the ephod and teraphim and the idol and went along with the people. So they resumed their journey, putting the little ones, the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they were some distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the house near Micah's house were called out and they took, overtook the Danites. They shouted to the Danites who turned around and said to Micah, what is this matter that you have come with such a company? He replied, you take my gods that I made and a priest and go away, and what have I left? How then can you ask me, what is the matter? And the Danites said to him, you had better not let your voice be heard among us or else hot-tempered fe fellows will attack you and you will lose your life and the lives of your household. Then the Danites went on their way. When Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. The Danites, having taken what Micah had made, and the priest who belonged to him came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting, put them to the sword and burned down the city. There was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with Aram. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. They rebuilt the city and lived in it. They named the city Dan after their ancestor Dan, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was formerly Laish. Then the Danites set up the idol for themselves. Jonathan, son of Gurusham, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Danites until the time the land went into captivity. So they maintained as their own Micah's idol that he had made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. The word of the Lord. The New Testament lesson comes from the books of, book of Acts 8. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Holy Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift, God's gift, with money. You have no part or share for this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours. And pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. Now after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. The word of the Lord.
Our gospel reading comes from the book of John, our gospel, chapter 6. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with the disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming to him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not be enough to buy bread for each of them, even to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. Then Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The word of the Lord. From today's readings, I'd like to focus on the book of Acts, that reading, and then also the uh, testimony of Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, which would have been closer to 10 or even more, uh, 10,000, uh, because in that time period when they say the feeding of the 5,000, it was not included in the number of the women and children. It was a large group. It was certainly a miracle. There are things going on in Acts uh, that I won't spend a lot of time on, but I want to give you the context of. Many times we see these things in Acts, which is a very transitional book for the church. Why? Well, there had never been um, a new covenant people, the church, the old covenant people related to God uh, through the means he had established. And Christ came and fulfilled the purposes of the Mosaic law and the sacrificial system, which pointed to him. He was now the risen, the crucified and risen Lord. And he establishes his church by sending his spirit to uh, indwell his church as we gather in his name, uh, as a people, his bride, but also individually to dwell uh, in us, uh, those who are baptized with faith in him. You have different things happening in Acts that many people who are untrained in scripture and untrained in the history of the church and how the church has interpreted uh, the book of Acts over years who will pick and choose things out of Acts from the surface and uh, even create whole theologies that uh, are not biblical and uh, they abuse the text. One of the things that happens here is you see that the Sumerians had received the word of God. And it accepted it. And they'd been baptized in the name of, the G of Jesus, but that something needed to happen. What needed to happen is there needed to be approval by the apostles that indeed the gospel could go to somebody like the Samaritans. Why? We see this happening with uh, those that have been baptized in the baptism of John. Sometimes the Spirit comes before baptism. Sometimes the Spirit comes after baptism. What's going on here? We've got to be careful not to set precedences in, in Acts when there's transitional things happening to show that the gospel has come to everyone. John's disciples now become directly the disciples of Jesus Christ. They received the baptism of John, but they had not received the baptism of Jesus and thus the Spirit of God. Here with the Samaritans, uh, before this, we find that Philip had preached and this man, Simeon, who had been a magician, in other words, he'd been using false and dark powers for his own uh, glory and insights, some what we may call sorcery, and he heard the gospel and was baptized by Philip. 
these men come down, and when there is a, um, the Samaritans hear the word of God and respond, he sees the apostles come and lay hands on, on these, and the Holy Spirit came upon them in power. This was done, I believe, and in the context of the scripture, to show that these people had been accepted even though they were Samaritans. It was important, just like it was important when the apostles were waiting for the coming of spirit, the Spirit in Pentecost, that it be shown that this power of the Spirit had come upon them and something was going on, something significant. You remember this happened in the Old Testament with Saul. Saul, who uh, many of us question, um, ever truly had a faith in Yahweh. But Saul, the Spirit comes upon him after he's, he's chosen king, and he is pre, uh, filled with the Spirit and is with the prophets and is uh, giving these uh, prophecies and speaking in such a way that the Spirit obviously, and is in kind of an ecstasy, the obviously the Spirit had come upon him. In this case, Paul's, in Saul's case, in the Old Testament, it was a temporary filling for a certain purpose. In this case, this filling that came, this work of the Spirit, although the outcome of the power was temporary, the, the dwelling was going to stick. With our conversion to Christ, putting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, entering the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit is now given to us in that process of conversion and through water as as christ tells us we are born of water and the spirit the water and the spirit are connected as is faith and commitment to jesus christ baptism is a prayer to god to say save me and i will follow you and god's connection and baptism is with us is to accept us as his children and to bless us but even though simeon had been baptized Simeon had some problems. And Simeon sees what happens. He sees the power and he's not impressed that somebody's coming to Christ and seeing those things. But as the apostle says, you've got some problems in your heart. Let's read it. Now when Simeon, excuse me, Simon the sorcerer, when Simon saw the spirit was given through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, he offered them money. Give me also this power, so that anyone who I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing what you said will happen to me. It seems that Simon doesn't understand the gospel, but wait a second, he'd been baptized. How could he have been baptized and not now understand the gospel? Well, I think this is the point, isn't it? None of our sacraments, while they hold mystery and power, baptism and the Eucharist, Holy Communion being the highest of them, they are not superstitions. They are not magic talismans that just by rubbing them or engaging them that somehow we will have this power. The sacraments are not, first of all, about us. They're about God and his mercy. We engage the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion in worship to God and opening our hearts to the way he mysteriously works through them. It is a physical act of worship. Is it a physical way of us to thank God. It is a physical way of God blessing us. We enter in in submission to him and in a communal sharing of these communal sacraments. When we make anything magic, including the power of the Holy Spirit, we have gone away to our own idolatry. We have gone away to our own thinking. This is greatly, greatly seen in much of American Christianity, Pentecostalism, and the charismatic movement. Even within Anglicanism, there are those who, what they're focused on is all the wonderful miracles that they're doing and the prayers they're answering. And they're constantly having to tell you about all the ways that the Holy Spirit is using them and the miraculous ways in which God worked through them. Of course, when you start to try to evaluate 
if something miraculous actually happened again, it gets a little stickier. Those are just small examples. The power of the Spirit is available to us. God does still work through all of the spiritual gifts, if he so chooses, and miracles do occur. But these are not about our glory. This is about loving our God with all our heart and soul and loving our neighbor as ourselves and the glory of God. We stay as open vessels, but we don't do magic prayers and rub magic talismans to get the Holy Spirit to do what we want. There's nothing new under the sun, indeed. In, the, in Acts, you see the different laying on of hands to again show what? Cornelius, Gentiles can be saved. Samaritans can be saved. John the Baptist's disciples are brought in as disciples of Christ. There are purposes for why these things are coming, but there's also biblical teaching and clarity in the way the early church and the apostles understood these things that we must listen to and wisely consider. This is why maturity in our leadership is so important. Large numbers, crowds, and magic tricks and power have been around in every group that's ever existed. And that's really, if you want to grow a big organization, organization quickly, that's how you do it. But something that matters lasts, something that matters has depth and wisdom and discerning gifts in Christianity will be welcomed, not despised and marginalized. What does he say to Simon? Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, because they felt like it was a pretty deep problem, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Baptism is not about magic, it's about repentance. And when we baptize a child, just like they circumcised young children before they knew, planting within them the sign of the covenant and the hope of true faith, we believe in the work of baptism, that the seed of faith is, faith is planted in that child, but that child must claim that seed. He must claim his work, that mysterious work of baptism for himself, because without faith, there is no salvation. When we look in the gospel reading, we see a similar thing. Jesus does this wonderful miracle. And what happens? The people are extremely impressed by it. In this context, in the Gospel of John, um, they add something that the Gospel of Matthew doesn't, for instance. Gather up all these fragments. Here he had distributed the small amount of food. He had multiplied it. He had given this great miracle and fed these people thousands upon thousands. But when the people saw the sign he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. This is the one we've been waiting for, connected with the Messiah. And when Jesus realized that they're about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Simon would have received that. Many Christian leaders today would have loved that glory, would have loved that. Oh, I must be God's true whatever. Look at how these people are fawning over me. But Jesus had his father's timetable in mind, father, his father's will in mind. He knew that his road would go through suffering to become a king, not with accolades, power, money, and with the world values. Oh, how easily we're sucked in. Let us be thankful today for the power of the Spirit. Let us be thankful for the indwelling power of the Spirit and that God can do wonderful things through us in blessing and loving other people as we open ourselves as empty vessels to his Spirit's control and work, whatever spiritual gifts he's given us. And that he uses his people, he has gathered people, the Spirit is with us in a special way the Bible teaches us and the church understood. When we gather in word and sacrament, and the power and blessing that can be there and what we can take through the power of the Spirit to the world around us through the gospel message and our faithful living. But let us not turn to superstition and magic. If I just pray the right way, if I just say it the right way, if I just make the right motions the right way, then the Holy Spirit will do what I want. Then things will go my way. No, our search is to love and know our God. 
coming from Psalm 119. I love your word. I love your truth. You are the prime mover in my life. You are the one who dictates. I open my heart, oh God. How do you want to use me? Let us not seek fame and glory and selfishness. Trying to use the Christian church, her sacraments, or manipulate the Holy Spirit for our own means, but to faithfully love our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourself. Thanks be to God. Let us say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. He descended into hell, excuse me. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray the prayer the Lord has left for us as our model and also as coming before him and putting his kingdom where it belongs. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Collect of the Day. Almighty God, you have given your Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of a godly life. Give us grace to receive, thankfully, the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's skip down now to our prayers and intercession. intercessions. Let us pray now for our own needs and those of others. Father, I bring uh, my father before you who is uh, continuing to have to heal from the staph infection that has uh, returned again. And as this is often in the case with uh, MRSA and staph infections that um, they tend to return, we pray that you would strike this uh, infection from his body. I pray that you would um, heal him so that he can recover and come back to strength uh, in his um physical therapy and um, avoid the pain that is connected. Give my mother strength as she walks with them. Uh, we pray for the young family and we pray for our church with the loss of our dear sister, Judy. Uh, thank you for her life. We give you praise. We pray for Brad Fowler as he continues to struggle with um, a struggle with cancer, Father God, that you would give him your strength and peace, that you would touch his body that you would uh, help him as he seeks to put his faith and trust continually in you through this time. Uh, I pray uh, also for um, many, Lord, um, who are also on our prayer list. We think of um, Norma's friend who has just discovered she has a macular degeneration, Lord, in her eyes, and I just pray that you would give her strength and the doctor's wisdom in this situation. I pray for Annie's continued healing of her hand and wisdom about um, how to proceed. I pray for many in our uh, community that need work, Lord. We pray that you would strike down this coronavirus. We pray that you would help us to develop a vaccine, that testing would be normal, that we would uh, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves as Christians, 
and not get sucked into the anxiety and fear that people have, but know that we have nothing to fear in you. Whether Whatever disease or earthquakes or mountains or disasters, you are our Lord and our rock and our salvation. Help us to trust that and take things a day at a time. I pray that you would use the Church of St. Peter and St. Paul to be a light in a dark storm for people out on high waters and in dangerous places to know that there is hope and there is safety in you and that you will walk with and heal people in your salvation and your ways. And I pray that you'd help our church to grow, not because we want to survive and, and keep going and have our church the way we want it, but Lord, that we might see people come from the darkness to the light, that they would uh, know and that the kingdom of God would spread through using your vessels, the church. And I pray we'd use the church of St. Peter and St. Paul to be light and salt in this valley. I lift up now all those others that are in need and suffering today. You know them all. We lift these now, we collect them and lift them to you, Father God, knowing that you hear these requests, guide us, strengthen us today, help us to follow you, help us to turn from sin, continue to grow in faith and believing you, in Jesus' name. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and keep you unto everlasting life. Amen.